Uh, if they are tuned in now, welcome Family Church. We are excited to have Pastor Paul's church joining us this morning. Um, we stole their pastor, and so they had to do something. So they're going to tune in online, and Paul gets to preach to both. Oh, are you on? Is that I'm what's on. going on here? Is that me? That may be a little bit of an echo there. I'll get you. Yeah, you turn that one off. I've never had that before. That's a new experience. Um, so we're excited to have Pastor Paul. He is the lead pastor of Family Church in Maple Creek. He is also headed up, well, one man camp for sure, a couple more on the way. And uh, yeah, Pastor Paul is a good friend of mine. I've been looking forward to this weekend for a while because we talked a while ago about getting you to come. And I'm just, I'm pumped that you're here. So uh, I'm going to invite everyone, give, you, give him your undivided attention as he brings the word this morning. Thank you, Pastor Matt. You guys hear me all right? I have this beautiful big head that um, is not necessarily made for these mics, but if, if, bear with me if I have to adjust it a bunch. <laughs> we okay? Or are we ringing? Well, good morning. Welcome. Good morning, Maple Creek, Redverse, whoever else is watching online. It's, uh, this is a fun experiment, and we'll, we'll see how it goes. But uh, yeah, my name is, is Paul Martins. I'm a pastor in Maple Creek, the opposite west side of the province you don't know how big saskatchewan is till you drive across it and then it's uh it's like oh there's a lot of country here and i'll be honest with you the the southern trip here is not the most exciting there's uh at least you guys have some pump jacks to look at you know when you get over here that's good um but anyway i just i am blessed and honored to be with you guys i don't know if you were able to throw up a picture of my family if if you can if not that's all good but i have a, an amazing wife and three kids at home and uh, this morning, I just want to, um, I just feel like the, the Lord gave me an assignment to encourage you with my life story, and, or at least some of it. And, uh, and just, I, I just, my prayer this morning is that you would walk away from this knowing that God loves you, that he is amazing, and that he will never leave you. And uh, you guys want me to switch? Yeah. All right. All right. So let's pray, and we'll jump in. Lord, I just thank you for your heart, for us. I thank you, Jesus, for your faithfulness in our lives. I thank you for your goodness. And Jesus, I just pray that this morning that you would speak to us. God, whatever is on your heart for each one of us, Lord, that we would receive all that you have for us. And I pray this wouldn't just be another Sunday. I pray this wouldn't be just another day where we go through routine, but I pray for all of us, God, that we would encounter you your faithfulness, your goodness, and your kindness. And Lord, we just put aside every distraction and we invite you to come and to have your way in our hearts and in our lives. In Jesus' name, everybody said? Amen. Amen. All right, well, the last, the last number of weeks at home, we've been talking about evangelism and how um, each one of us is called to be a witness, to tell our story. As it says in 1 Peter, to actually have an answer or a reason prepared for our faith. Amen? I'm just going to take this off, Pastor Matt. And, uh, and so we're, we're called to, to be prepared in season, out of season, all the time, to be able to be a witness. And, and what is a witness? A witness is someone who simply shares. If you're called into court, you come to share what you saw or heard, right? And, and as followers of Jesus, we are called to be a witness, to share what we've seen and heard from Scripture, and also how we've encountered Jesus in our lives, what he's done, what he's said, how he's changed us. Amen? Amen? All right. I love it when you guys talk back. It's good. I'm working on my church at home, too. Uh, we're getting better, though. And so, anyway, this morning, um, you know, I, I just want to encourage you, all through my life, I have seen the reality of Jesus backing up his word, of being who he claims to be, of, of being a part of my life, seeing him move, actually being able to know him personally, and not just as a theory or an idea, but actually being able to have a relationship with him. And so, um, you know, there's a, uh, some scriptures that, that always jump out at me. Um, one of them is this promise in scripture that in Jeremiah 29, that you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. And there is this invitation to all of us to actually to know him personally, to know him uh, as a friend, to actually experience him and walk with him, and, and not just, again, not just in theory, but to actually truly be a friend with him. And so my story is simply this. I was born 
Um, <laughs> I was born to a, a father who was an atheist. My dad actually wanted to abort me when he found out my mom was pregnant. And thankfully, she stood up to him and said, no, we're having this baby. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. And, um, and when I was about six or seven years old, there was some, a, a few couples in our community that decided on purpose to just start a Bible study to reach out to my parents, which, if nothing else, I think is a good encouragement to all of us that, you know, there might be people in our lives that we just simply need to make an invitation and say, hey, would you come sit around the table with us? We'd love to talk about Jesus. And, uh, and my dad went to argue. He, he went with the intention of saying, you guys are dumb for believing in a God. And uh, several, I don't know exactly how long it was, but several months later, uh, my parents ended up getting saved. And, and as a six, seven-year-old, again, I just kind of followed in their footsteps, and I invited Jesus into my life. Um, and that began, began our spiritual journey together. And as a young child, we just saw the Lord move, and he just became a part of who we were, in our family, our culture, in our home. Um, you know, just to give you an example, I, I, I was six, seven years old, cooking hot dogs. And um, I went to look on the stove to see if they were done, if they were boiling, and I couldn't see in the pot because it was on the back burner. And so I pulled myself up and I put my hand on the front burner and discovered the front burner had been turned on, not the back burner. And I know you guys are rural communities, so you're probably familiar with brandings. But I had a brand on my hand. I, that, every ring on that burner was sunk into my hand. And if you've ever had a bad burn, they're terrible. And um, anyway, I, I, we, we lived about half an hour out of town up in the Cypress Hills. And I remember having my hand in ice water. And it, it hurt terribly. And we prayed as a family. And I remember, you know, sometimes we think we need to know all the right words. I just remember being a really simple prayer. Jesus, help. <laughs> Jesus, help. I couldn't take my hand out of the water. Well, when I took it out of the water, after we'd finished praying, it looked like this. And there was not a mark, not a blister, not a... And I've got lots of other scars from different burns <laughs> in the rest of my life, but that one was completely healed instantly. And so even as a young child, I began to recognize that Jesus is there, that prayer works, and that he actually listens to us when we call on him. And um, another example I love to share, um, I was taking violin lessons in Medicine Hat, which is about an hour west of, of where we live, and we would drive up, and my mom, I was seven years old, my mom was pregnant, nine months pregnant, like out to here with my sister, and uh, we were driving one day, and she's not feeling well. It's, it's August, it's the end of August, and in, I don't know how hot it gets here in the summer, but in Maple Creek, we get a lot of heat. And... Uh, Mid-30s is very common, and so she wasn't feeling well, so she pulled over. We actually had an old uh, police car that my dad had gotten at an auction. It was a propane police car, and uh, I think the smell sometimes just drove her nuts. So she pulled over, went for a hike, and as a seven-year-old, I don't know how long it was, but my patience disappeared, and I thought, I'm going to go check on my mom. So I locked the doors of the car and headed out to find her in the field, and I found her, and I was, you know, proud. Hey, Mom, I, uh, I locked the doors in the car, and, and, and she's like, great, where are the keys? Oh, they're in the ignition still. And so I think every parent could probably relate to this. My mom doesn't remember this part the same way I do, but I remember her getting pretty mad at me and, you know, the yelling and the, why did you do that? And it, I mean, it wasn't bad, but just that reaction like, ah. And then so they were standing on the side of the road, you know, trying to hitchhike on the number one highway. Pregnant mom like this, little kid, me, thumb out. No one would stop. And it was incredibly hot. And so we began to, uh, I remember looking for a rock and tried to break the window all where we were for whatever reason. If you know our area, we have cobble rocks everywhere, big rocks. For whatever reason there, we couldn't find anything bigger than a small rock. Couldn't break the window. Um, we looked around for wire, nothing. And of course, you know, sometimes, if anybody relate, last resort, we should pray. <laughs> and so I, I remember kneeling on the side of the road and, and praying. And when we finished praying, we got up and turned around. And the gate that we had opened and shut multiple times walking around looking for rock and, and everything else, there's this piece of wire about this long with no barbs and just dangling on the top wire. I mean, it was impossible physically for it to have been there before. And we grabbed it, made a hook, popped the lock, and we we're out of there. And those kind of things stick with you when you see God move in your life. And, and so fast forward, uh, you know, over the years, th those types of examples as we were growing up, my mom used to struggle with migraines, and we learned we would pray and she would get healed. We would pray when the pain would come and the migraine would stop. And it gave me an appetite, a desire to know God more because he is so good and so faithful. As I got older and I went into high school, my appetite began to change. I began to desire things like I wanted to be popular. I wanted to have a lot of friends. And so I, I don't know if I actually had this conversation with the Lord, but I remember basically thinking in my head like, God, I know you're real, but I'm doing my own thing for a while. 
And I just kind of came to that place where, like, I'm just, I'm just going to go enjoy the world. And, and that's basically what, what happened. For the next number of years, I got into the party scene. I love playing football and all kinds of sports. Um, and as I graduated and was, you know, trying to figure out what to do, I was offered scholarships to play football at, at several different universities. And uh, I chose Saskatoon because I had several friends going there. And so I went and I went to the Hilltop and the Husky camps. And uh, my goal was I'll play football. I'm going to be a chartered accountant. So I was going to go university for commerce. And uh, I'll make money and I'll have fun, enjoy the ride kind of thing. And uh, in, I went past the first camp, went to the second camp uh, going into the fall. And I was in a car uh, as a passenger. We were coming from a hockey practice. And the person I was with decided to race someone else in our team. And they were flying down the road, and they tried to take a curve in the city of Saskatoon at about 80 kilometers an hour in a Cavalier, which didn't work well. And so we ended up slamming into the curb, went flying through the air, and I thought we were going to land in this lady's house for dinner kind of thing, like we were airborne, kind of Dukes of Hazard. And, of course, because I could see the whole thing coming, I leaned like this, grabbed onto the handles, and my whole back was twisted. And so when we hit the ground, everything, all the ligaments in here tore. And um, that was the end of football. And I remember over that next season, that next year or so, just feeling so lost because I thought I had it all figured out. I thought I had a dream. I was going to do this. And, um, and as I was going to university, I was just feeling empty. And, you know, if you've ever uh, wrestled with uh, even stuff like alcohol, you, you'll find that no matter where you turn, you try and put your faith, your trust, or find fulfillment in certain things, it doesn't work until you find the Lord. And I was looking at, you know, I remember I would get drunk and think, this does nothing for me. There's got to be more than this. And the amazing thing was, is my dad had arranged for me to live at the Bible College Res, the dorm, because it was cheaper. They cooked for us. And, you know, he, he put it to me in a way that I was like, yeah, that seems like a good idea. So I, I was living there and going to university, not living for the Lord at all. And um, I remember during this season, as I, again, I just began to recognize there's got to be something more than this. Um, some of the guys in, on my floor I began to notice, I'd be up doing an essay at one in the morning, and I'd go to the bathroom, and I'd hear them with a guitar, worshiping the Lord. And I'd, I'd hear them praying, and I thought, okay, there's something more here, you know? And so this, again, this appetite, this hunger in me began to desire, God, you know, if you have something for me, would you draw me, would you let me know? I went home on a weekend, and there was a guest speaker, and I prayed the simple prayer right before he got up to preach. I was like, God, if you have something for my life, would you speak to me through this guy? He got up to preach, he opened his eyes, he looked right at me. And he called me out, and he had like a three-minute prophetic word that actually I think is still on tape. I'm that old, cassette tapes. If you don't know what it is, Google it. Uh, but um, I still have, and over the next year, every time I'd show up in a church service, someone would walk up and say, I believe that God is calling you. And word for word, there would be chunks of that original prophetic word that they would speak over my life. And, uh, you know, if that doesn't get your attention, nothing will. And I began to recognize, okay, God. And one day at Bible college, um, I was still going to university, but one of the guys walked up to me. He said, hey, we have this open house weekend. We're building a worship team. I know you play violin. Would you come play with us? And I kind of laughed. I was like, you know how I'm living. Like, are you for real? And, he, and he's like, yeah. And so I said, sure. And on that weekend, um, you know, the Bible talks about the Apostle Paul having this encounter with Jesus, how he was riding, uh, going to a community to arrest Christians, to hassle them. And the light, the bright light came. Jesus spoke to him. And he had this encounter with the Lord that changed him. And I didn't have a, a bright light come, but in those moments, it was in the pre-service prayer times, not in the, any other part of the, the messages, but every pre-service prayer time as we gathered. God's love, I often tell people, it's like the ALS ice bucket challenge, you know, when they pour the ice on you. His love just hammered me. And I'm a pretty strong guy, and I just, I could not stand. Like, I, I was buckling. And I, it's one of those things where, um, you know, it wasn't like a fluffy whatever kind of love it was like, I, I literally met with God. And I knew that he loved me for who I was. I didn't have to try to be someone else. I knew that he cared about who I was and that he had a plan for my life. It's just one of those moments where I was instantly, I knew I was loved. And everything changed for me. And I said, God, I'm done running. I was in my, go, I was in my third year of commerce. I ended up dropping out and uh, went to Bible college. And my heart was, God, I want to get to know you and I want to help other people experience you like I have because this is the best thing ever. And so that's been the pursuit of my life. 
ever since then is to help people to encounter the presence and the love of God because it's real, it's tangible, it's not just an idea. We, we often hear the Sunday school version of, you know, Jesus loves you, yes, yes. We have it up here, but we don't always actually know him. And my heart for you and for anyone watching online is that you would know the love of God, that you would know that he is real, that he cares for you. And, you know, all through my life, I, one of the things that Jesus has done in me is I've seen healing. I've seen him, you know, the scriptures talk about how he came, that he healed sickness, he healed disease. That, and that's just been part of what's happened in my life. I, I went through a season where I had an a issue. I think it was probably a leftover injury from football, but I had an ankle problem and they couldn't explain. And I began to have chronic pain for, it was like five, six years where it was brutal. And I would take medication, I'd use a shovel in the yard to limp around, and it was affecting my life and my family life. And um, uh, we, we'd gone to every doctor, went to the top foot specialist in Western Canada, and he said, I've done every test I can, I'm looking at it, and he's like, I see your ankle is messed up, but nothing on here shows up that I can do surgery. And I remember being just totally overwhelmed, and like, well, what am I supposed to do? And um, one day I got up off the couch, get a drink of water, and go to bed, and I heard this clear thought in my mind, I knew it was God, he said, I'm going to heal you before your boy is born. My wife was pregnant with our third child, Caleb. Uh, he was born three days later, and she had to be induced. And so I dropped her at the front door because it all of a sudden, you know, labor came on fast. If you've ever had known someone that had a, a baby getting induced, it's like goes from zero to 100, like boom. And, um, and so I dropped her off the front door. I was able to run in there and literally within minutes was able to be there in time for him to be born. And I realized that I was able to run for the first time in years without pain. And, and he healed me. And, and I've seen how I, I flipped a quad on my daughter's birthday a number of years ago, um, and I broke several ribs because I landed on a big rock. And uh, after about six weeks, two months, we were in Calgary on holidays, and I was starting to heal up. And without thinking, we had bought a dresser at Ikea for one of our kids, and I lifted, reached over in the ground to pick up the box, and I felt the pop, pop, pop. And they all let go again, and I was in incredible pain. And as we're driving back to the hotel, Every bump was just sharp, sharp pain. I thought, no, not again. Like, I don't want to go through this for another few months. And our middle son, Benjamin, um, he, he said to me when we got to the hotel, he said, Dad, I feel like we're supposed to pray for you ten times. I said, okay, buddy, let's do it. And, um, and so he just, in childlike faith, I, I pray that the pain goes and you're healed in the name of Jesus. And he's like, one. <laughs> I pray that you're healed and the pain goes in the name of Jesus, two. By the time he got to ten, I had no pain. It was completely healed. And, and that's, you know, I, I've prayed for people with things like scoliosis. With a, I've seen a spine that's curved pop up straight. I've seen people with knee problems and back problems be completely restored. I, I, I was in a, with a group one time. We went to a mall, and we just prayed and said, Lord, who, who do you want me to pray for today? And I had a picture, just a flash of a person with a cane or a crutch. And then we walked in the front door of the mall, and here's this lady. She's about 60, 65 years old walking with a cane. And I walked up to her and just said, hey, can I pray for you? And she said, well, I have degenerative bone disease. I've been in pain for years. And was able to pray for her. And she left with a big smile and the cane on her shoulder. Said, I haven't had, been pain-free in years. And that's the Jesus we serve. And I really, truly believe that we need to understand, is, again, it's, it's not about um, bringing glory to a person, but it's about bringing glory to God. And the fact that he shows us in his word that he is alive in us and through us today that he wants to move in our hearts and in our lives. But we need to have an appetite and a hunger and a desire to see him be a part of our lives, to actually know him personally. Amen? I, um, after, after I went, to, uh, went through Bible college, I ended up in Africa for six months. I helped plant a church there. I came back, um, ended up in Manitoba for four and a half years as a pastor, and then felt the Lord lead us to Maple Creek. And so my wife and I moved to Maple Creek, and we've been there now ever since. I think it's been 15 years, 16 years. And I worked with my dad as uh, I was the youth and the worship pastor. I've worked in EMS casually. We've had cows on the side as well. And, you know, you just follow the Lord. Whatever the journey takes you, whatever you're doing in life, it doesn't matter. He wants to be a part of it. And, and he goes with you into the darkest places. He goes with you into the scariest places. I, I've, you know, driving an ambulance. I had the Lord tell me one time, we did everything we could for someone. And, and there was no shockable rhythm. There was nothing. And I jumped back in the front to drive. I radioed for another ambulance for help. And the Lord spoke to me and said, worship me. And I was like, it's not a good time, God. <laughs> and yet I just began to sing. I had no worship team. I had nothing. But I just began to sing. My partner, like 
10 seconds later, rips open the, the door here be between us, the front and the back, and he goes, they're breathing again. I just about hit the ditch. I've watched, I've been standing there being the person running the defibrillator, hitting the shock button and nothing, and then praying. I just speak life in Jesus' name and watching on the screen. Boop, 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 boop. I can't explain that. I can't prove it to you other than when the Lord tells you to pray, when he tells you to do something, you do it. He wants to be a part of your life. And my encouragement to you today is that there's more. He's real. And he loves you. The Bible tells us in James chapter 4 to draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. God gives us appetites for things. I, I think our appetite, there's a reason we eat every day. Is we're, it's, it's like a physical um, picture of our desire to have to continually go back to the Lord. We're, we hunger for food. We hunger for nourishment. We need to hunger for spiritual food and spiritual nourishment. We need to go before the Lord day in and day out and trust him and run after him. Amen? The hunger, and this is my heart for you this morning, is to ask yourself, what appetites are driving my life? What things do I hunger for? What things do I desire? Do I want to know God? You know, I can tell you about the meal that we had Friday night with the guys, and I can tell you about how amazing it was and how good it was, but if it's a whole different story to hear about it than actually be there and taste it. I can tell you, I've been to Victoria Falls, and it's incredible, you know, and I can tell you about the water hitting your face, the mist, and how beautiful and huge and magnificent they are, but it's a whole different thing for you if you actually go there and experience it yourself. I can tell you as a dad what it's like having that first child come into your life and how it's life-changing and you'll never sleep for a while and, and all the stuff. But, in, it, it, you know, I remember people warning me about some of that and telling me how amazing it is, but until you actually experience that, it's, it's just not the same. And I want to tell you that you can know about God, you can hear about him, you can, you can say, oh, maybe he's real, whatever, but until you experience him for yourself, it'll never be the same. He is inviting you to know him in relationship, to walk with him as a friend. And the, the things that you allow to drive you, the things that you allow, to, the appetites that you have in your life will, will dictate the way that you live. And you can, I'm not going to go into all those stories, but look, think about Jacob and Esau. Esau gave up his birthright because he was hungry. Think about the prodigal son who was in a pig pen. And um, sitting there hungry and desperate. And he reminds himself, even, it says in Luke 15, 17, how many of my father's servants have bread enough to spare and I perish with hunger? The thing that drove him to get out of his mess was his appetite. Are you hungry for the Lord? The Bible says in Psalm 34 that this is one of my favorite verses. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. That's like an invitation to actually experience. Michelle read earlier out of Ephesians 3 that we would know the height, the width, the depth of his love. That he's able to do immeasurably more than you ever thought or imagined. Again, it's because he loves you, because he's able, because it's who Jesus is. He is the only way to the Father. And he invites us to come and to know him personally, because he is the Son of God. And he has died so that your sin and my sin could be covered, and, f and we could be free, that we could have that free gift of salvation with him. But it only is through Jesus, and it's only through knowing him and walking with him. Matthew 5 says this, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. What are you believing for? Who have you known God to be in your life? Have you experienced the freedom that comes from giving him everything, surrendering your heart, surrendering your past, Surrendering the sin. Listen, every single one of us, if we live with other people, there are going to be times where you're going to be offended, <laughs> where you're going to be betrayed, you're going to be hurt, you're going to be let down. It's going to happen. Have you experienced the freedom and the peace and the joy of just learning to forgive and letting his love heal and bring hope again?
Have you ever believed that he can heal you today, physically, emotionally, in any area that you're struggling? And I want to encourage you too, because I just, I just sense, you know, if, you're, if you have a relative, uh, maybe a prodigal son or daughter like I was, who just walked from the Lord, don't give up. Keep praying for them. I didn't tell this part of my story, but I'll, I'll just let you know. My mom felt called to fast and pray for 40 days for me in that season. And it was right at the end of that when I had that encounter with the Lord. And if the Lord leads you to pray for people, don't ever underestimate the power of your prayer because you need to know who you're walking with. And he is God, and he is able, and he hears your prayers, just like Pastor Matt said earlier. You and I are all equipped to pray because we're his kids. Don't stop believing. Don't ever doubt the power of standing on his word. But to draw near to God means that I have to put him first. It means I have to put other things aside. And this is a busy life, a busy world that we live in, and I have to make him that priority. It costs you. I, I want to make that really clear. If you're going to follow Jesus, it's going to cost you. It costs you time. It costs you energy. You have to put him first. But the reward of knowing him is joy and hope and peace. And there's nothing better. And I want to extend the invitation that he's extended to me to say, would you come and know me? Would you give your life? Would you surrender everything so that I can come and live in you? See, we have the, the invitation to die daily to make him Lord of our life. It means there's no room. You're not allowed to carry sin. You're not allowed to do your own thing. <laughs> That's hard. But the reward is so worth it. So I want to pray for you. I'd like to close. And I just want to make myself available. I'm going to be in the prayer room. We've got some questions. We're going to pop up on the screen. You can discuss at your tables. Maple Creek, I just encourage you guys, pray for one another. You know, if someone is sick this morning, I just encourage you to, to pray for one another. You guys here, if you need prayer, I'd love to pray with you over there. If you, I have seen Jesus heal so many times. And I just, because, because of what I've seen him do in me, I know he's the same God. And he'll do that in you too. And I would love to be able to believe with you for a miracle in your body, in your life, for your family members who need him. And I, I want to just know that Jesus is here with us right now. So God, I just thank you for this church. I thank you for Maple Creek. I thank you that no matter where we are, where we are a witness to what you've done, we're a witness to who you are. Jesus, we are able to carry the goodness of God with us because of the relationship that we have with you. And I pray more than anything today, Lord, that people would come to know that you are alive, that you are real, that you care about us. And it's, Lord Jesus, you gave your life so that we could know you personally. And you're inviting us, but we do have to seek you. We have to search for you with all of our heart. We have to, to draw near to you. We have to come. You're inviting us. The invitation is wide open. I pray, God, that we would put aside everything, that we would, that we would have appetites and hunger for your, your heart, Jesus, that you would have your way in us and through us. And Jesus, I pray that you'd be glorified in each of our lives. That you'd be honored by the way that we live. And I pray for this church, this community, and the surrounding area, God, that they would come to know you. And I pray that this church would be a family who loves one another, who cares for one another. Who practices being the example that you've given us, Jesus, that we do family, that we do community well. So I pray for breakthrough. And I pray that this church would be a light and a beacon, a lighthouse to this area. That it would bring hope and joy. And it's not the building, it's the people. It's the people, God. So I just pray that you would light a spark, a passion, and, and again, stir up an appetite, a desire for more of you in our hearts. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.